Call the meeting of the Waterbury Village trustees together here for Wednesday, April 25th. We're at 3 o'clock. Must be the rainy weather brought all the people out to this afternoon meeting. They didn't have anything else to do. Um, we're meeting at 3 because of the annual Historical Society meeting at 5.30 tonight. So we met early so some of us could attend that. Um, are there any modifications to anything that's on the agenda? Or? I've got uh, one uh, information item from Jeff Kilgore's office, and I have a uh, budget report. If there's not time, we can wait. It's not much of a budget this year, so if you want to put it on and we have time for it, that's fine, and if we don't have time for it, we can hold it to the next meeting. Can we do it after the minutes? Whatever you want. We can do everything at the end. Okay. Things that I've talked about. Sure. Um, is there anybody here for, as members of the public, for something that isn't on the agenda? I haven't seen the agenda, but I'm here for the historical presentation. I thought probably you were here for the historical presentation. I am. Just, that's what I said. Yeah. And the charter. Okay. okay. Um, hearing nothing else. Um, First up is the concert schedule at Rusty Parker Park. Lynn, do you want to join us? And you've got the schedule, and <clears throat> you're ordering the weather? Yes, sun every Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm here to request permission for the park uh, from six, six o'clock would be start time, 8.30 ending from June 7th to August 16th. So is that shorter than you did last year? Or same. Sa same. How many total? Um, four, eight, eleven. Eleven? Um, do you have any suggestions or changes? Or no. You've got your decibel meter? Or? I'm pretty happy. They've done a good job. Thank you. I don't see any problem with it as it is. Any new bands or anything? Or? Mm -hmm. Well, every year I try to mix it up, yeah. There's two new ones. Yep. Yeah, I got a copy of list somewhere, but yep. great. House so of Fire? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's every third, every, every day, 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 day. yes. Beginning on June... Uh, 7th through August, August 16th. Um, you want to make a motion to approve that? I move that we approve uh, concerts at the park on, from June 7th, August 16th, 6 to 8.30 at night. I'll approve that. Uh, not approve it, I'll second it. Second that. <laughs> Um, the motion's been made and seconded to approve the uh, schedule for the concerts at Rusty Park, Park um, starting on June 7th and uh, through August 16th, starting at 6 p.m., going till 8.30. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 And is the uh, farmer's market on the same day still? Or? Yes. So it benefits them to have more people around. And yeah. Have they filed a request or anything yet, or? No. But I was at the office of their insurance agent because I had a notice that their insurance had been canceled or was going to be canceled mm -hmm. for lack of payment. The village is a named insured and. I was there on other business, but while there, I asked about it, and he said, "Oh, they paid the day before the thing expired, so they're all they're planning to do it, obviously." Okay. Well, thank you for coming in, Lynn, and we thank wish you. you a successful season and good weather. And yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. The Rotary for providing that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Next up is a review of the historical survey of portions of the village. 
um, that we were looking to uh, possibly expand the historic district um, and things. And uh, you want to introduce God here, Dean, sure. to kind of explain what you're doing? Absolutely. And we're going to use the. Um, yeah, Scott's going to get the um, this laptop, and if we have any incompatibility, we can switch right over to our laptop if there are any issues. So if we want so, to see it, we need to move over there? Uh, probably would be a good idea to come around this side and just yeah, roll, roll around. And Scott's got a presentation that he's going to do here. We just have to get the, his computer compatible with the projector. Like I say, if not, he's got it on a thumb drive, and we can, we can put it on to mine. So, um, <laughs> I was sliding, it was left. Yeah, there's a, it was, yeah. Okay, the light was on, right? Can, yeah, can you switch it to show your presentation? Just what I, uh, oh. Let's see what yep, this looks like we're headed in the right direction. Great. So, I'll just introduce the project for the benefit of, uh, Neighbors and all that are here. Um, so I'm Steve Lotzvich. I'm the community planner for the town and village. And uh, the village of Waterbury uh, decided to resurvey our village of Waterbury historic district, or Waterbury Village Historic District is technically what it's called. And so um, the voters approved funding for this project. And we hired Scott Newman, who is here today, as our consultant. And uh, Scott's been working diligently uh, resurveying the properties, and he's going to go through this in detail. We uh, decided to survey some additional areas on South Main Street, basically uh, going from uh, approximately Batchelder Street, south end of uh, or the south entrance into the state complex, down to the uh, Maplewood Convenience Store. Uh, formerly Depot Beverage. We also uh, added the area on Union Street, the low end of Union Street that goes out to um, the uh, North Main Street. And uh, then we also um, added an area around uh, the Thatcherbrook School. It's actually the area that's bounded by High Street, Hill Street, Railroad Street, and Stowe Street. Uh, that is not currently in the Waterbury Village Historic District, and Swayze Court. So uh, Scott has looked at all of these areas, and uh, the goal of the project is to uh, first submit to the state, and I've got a schedule here that we can talk about after Scott's presentation. So uh, we would submit this to the state, to the, their Division for Historic Preservation. Uh, they review the um, complete uh, report. And uh, once their comments are incorporated, um, they forward it to the National Park Service, which is the entity that reviews um, historic district nomination for the federal government to uh, have uh, districts listed on the National Register. And the, the end goal is to have <coughs> the revised district listed on both the state and the National Register. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Scott and uh, have him go through his presentation. Well, that's the first half of my presentation right there. So <laughs> I'm on. I can start in paid. Um, no, thanks for the opportunity. And uh, if it's not clear, I think there's going to be another public meeting. Is that right? That's Here, correct. Right? So, yeah, we are ready to submit. So in the second meeting, I mean, that's where uh, we talk more specifically about the history of Waterbury. Um, going through the, the different sort of layers of buildings and building types and so on. Some of that will come up today, but today, um, as my understanding was, we're among the mechanics, the status, the timeline, examples of this, uh, the areas surveyed, and sort of the, the, the metadata behind, behind this project. Um, so I hope if you're wanting to see all pretty pictures of buildings, you come back to the next one because they're going to be There'll be a lot more, although we do have one to start. So again, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to do this work for 106 Associates. And Steve, you've been terrific providing guidance and support all the way through this. If you could tell me again how much time we have right now, I'll try and. Sure. Um, as I understand it, we have till about quarter till four or so. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're Not flexible. Go ahead. 
<laughs> well, maybe I'll, I'll give a few minutes. Um, it's certainly been a good opportunity to spend more time in Waterbury. I spent a lot of time here during the permitting for the Main Street project years ago and worked with Steve on that. And that's when we were tagging all the trees and had our measuring tape out about uh, trenches and sidewalks and everything. And, and um, so I sort of feel like I'm back in familiar turf in some extent. Um, as far as doing the National Register, it's safe to say that Vermont is behind on their National Register uh, nomination statewide. We've got 12,000 uh, buildings and, and sites and uh, uh, districts listed, but it's, um, it's pretty uh, a well known fact that we're fairly behind, particularly with these village nominations. So I think you're very timely and sort of uh, good foresight in, in getting this done now. It's been 40 years um, since the last one, and a lot has changed. Um, and a lot has not changed, remarkably enough, in, in Waterbury. And just a couple of the other towns that are doing the, the Woodstock is now underway doing theirs. They just put out an RFP. Uh, Bennington is 2008. Rutland is 1980, and that's just a very small one in the downtown. Montpelier is 2017. And I want to tell you that Montpelier's uh, nomination took 14 years to do. So you're, you're doing well in the timeline, too. Um, Winooski has no district, no national registered district at all. And there you're talking about a very substantial area. Um, Burlington has a number of small national registered districts that all sort of connect at Church and Maine and go off in different directions. Uh, Brattleboro has a very small one and only in their downtown. So really, uh, you are ahead of the curve in terms of uh, you're doing your village nomination. Certainly. Uh, not playing catch up at all. So, what's the National Register? I don't want to go over this in too much detail, but it says at the bottom there that 12,000 building structures, sites, and districts in Vermont have been nominated and listed to the National Register. And it is a roll of, of properties that are, are deemed worthy of uh, preservation at the national level. Um, so what are some of the advantages, uh, certainly advantages of having a district known for planning purposes for you all in the, in the village and soon to be just town? Town of Waterbury, is that right? Um, I don't know. <laughs> We're soon to be only the town. Soon to be only the town, yeah. He said, he said it perfect. Soon to be only the town, yeah. No <laughs> mess um, Certainly there are advantages that you can tap into for travel and tourism because National Register districts get on certain lists and you can ex exploit that um, for tourism. And in study after study, it's shown why do people come to Vermont? It's for that compact New England village center to experience the authenticity of Vermont's history. So this is certainly in line with that economic development um, opportunities and certainly that's kind of more about the, uh, the historic tax credits at the bottom. Um, and once these properties are listed, uh, in theory, they can then apply for a 20% historic tax credit on qualifying rehabilitation projects. Um, you know, we can do an hour on that, but just safe to say for the moment that, that's, that that possibility will be out there for a much uh, larger range of properties in Waterbury than, than currently are. I should know one thing, and I'll note it now, and I'll note it again at the next meeting, and underline it, and highlight it, and bold it. it. There are no encumbrances that come with National Register listing. It does not mean that um, you have to paint your door a certain color, or you have to keep your roof line, or you, you can't put on additions. Um, encumbrances like that normally come from the local level, design review districts, for example, DRBs, that kind of thing. The National Register imposes no restrictions whatsoever. So you can, in fact, have your property listed in the National Register on Tuesday and demolish it on Wednesday uh, without the federal government having anything to say about it. We hope you wouldn't do that, but in theory, you can. There are no restrictions whatsoever. Uh, Steve, if anybody has any questions, how do you want to? Do you, Why don't we go while through the presentation? Up? Okay, let's go through the presentation yeah. and then um, sure. open it up. Unless yeah. you know, there's something urgent, by all means, interrupt. Happy to do it. But. So this is just the cover page of the last nomination that was done in uh, 1978. I don't have my screen up here, which I normally do because of the way it connected, so I'll be looking up here a little bit. And it was done by Terry Winters, and she was a Columbia HP graduate. Currently, I looked her up, and she's currently doing marketing in Boston. 
doing well, but having nothing to do with historic preservation anymore. I gather Boston marketing is making a more, uh, more lucrative business. I don't know. Um, you know, the nomination was helpful in some instances for my work, and in other instances it proved to be pretty confusing because she was mapping and describing a bunch of properties, um, some of which are no longer here, many of which she did not provide addresses for, so it really took a lot of uh, uh, sort of on the ground and mapping research to figure out which property was which. Um, but we did, we did get through that ultimately. So this is Ms. Winter's map. As you can see here, this was yeah, done in 1978. Includes 187 properties. It also includes a state hospital complex. You can see the, you can see that boundary line, faint sort of dash, right away looking line going around the historic district there. It includes the uh, the CBR uh, portion as it, well at least part of it as it goes through the north part of the village. So you can see that it's um, it's not a pointer, right? Like, um, I don't well, let's assume that left is, I mean, for my purposes, the, the, the Main Street Waterbury is a little off kilter. So for the purposes of my study, so I'm not constantly saying northeast and southwest, which would drive people crazy in the descriptions. Um, at this point, it, well, you can see the north arrow right here is up there. So if you can imagine describing the different elevations of buildings using northwest. So if the convention is that on the left of this is north, to the right is south, the bottom is west, top is east. So there you go. And that's stated in the beginning of my text, so there's no uh, confusion about what that is. So you can see on the, on the right-hand side, it's cut off just south of Batchelder. Um, on the north, it sort of goes up to the, the present roundabout, just about. And then it stops short up on Union Street, where it bends down to meet Main Street. So, you know, why did they come up with those boundaries then? It seems a little bit um, arbitrary, perhaps. But it's really not. In the 1970s, the districts were always smaller than they are today. And the reason is, well, let's take an example. On the, the south side, the reasoning at that time was that there are too many modern intrusions in that district. And at that time, they were looking for historic building, 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 building. They didn't want to see sort of shopping centers or anything like that interrupting the flow of the district. So you can see it's pretty consistent there. And once you get south of Batchelder, there are more newer buildings and some interruptions in there. So they didn't include that then. Uh, Union, if you look up in the top left, you can see the district didn't go down that bend in Union. And that's because there was a gap there between the next set of properties that are further uh, further west on Union now, further towards Main Street. So they considered that a point of discontinu discontinu discontinuous, how about that? Um, and why didn't they, for example, include Swayze Court? You can see up there the, on the very top, they didn't extend it down that street. Well, that's because you know several of those buildings are newer, a couple of them from the 1960s. And so in 1978, a 1960s building was pretty modern. So that's not the case today, but they actually qualified for the National Register. So I just want to explain, that's kind of why they, they cut that district uh, short. They also missed, well not missed, but didn't include several things even within this area, which, um, which are being included now, and that's um, Parker Court. I'm gonna show these a little bit later. Parker Court, Warner Court, Moody Court, the rest of Batchelder. That's kind of confusing why they didn't go in Batchelder. Uh, I, just, I really couldn't sort of figure that one. Where's Parker Court? Parker Court, it's right. You know, right I'm the municipal building where Ann lives. Yeah. Fire oh. station. Yeah, behind the fire station. Where does it go? The driveway is right there between the fire station and that little service station. And it goes back and tucked back there for. You told me Ann's property, I already know. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the names, and that's. <laughs> um, and Warren Court is by the horseshoe? Yes. Yeah. In fact, I so think it's... So it doesn't... But that's not indicated that it's not... Well, there's no structure shown on the map. They just... Right, it's within the boundaries, a lot of these places, but they just didn't pick up those properties. Okay. And um, I don't know why, other than to say that in the 1970s districts, and I've seen a lot of them, they're just smaller and there are a lot of omissions. 
they just they take like the cleanest, most contiguous parts of the village cores, and that's what made it onto the register. But yeah, I just I, never understood why the Deal House was never on there, which is the Red House. Yeah. Past From, bachelor, it's one of the most pristine, beautiful historical oh, houses in Waterbury. Well, will be. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it really is quite a problem. There are some fantastic buildings down there, so. Um, but you know that issue is is, is uh, going to be resolved. So what was my scope of work originally? You can see that this was the map I had to work with initially. In the, the center, kind of what purple? Um, I'm kind of colorblind. That area is the initial, the original district, and then the areas that I was asked to look at were um, sort of top left and bottom right. And that top left is Union Street. Um, where we looked at before, bends back to Maine, and then um, extending um, Main Street, South Main Street, um, all the way down to the river, and also including a little bit of River Street. So these were the two areas. I gather they were worked out with, uh, with the village and the state, um, and you know, that's why I was asked to look at those areas. It says over there. So can I ask just a question to understand that the green is what you're thinking of adding? Correct. Yeah. Those were the areas that, that were given to me initially right. to look at. Okay, because yeah. I'm just wondering, like, it crossed in the horseshoe? That was property? Well, those are the backs of properties. It doesn't include everything on the, all the buildings. So the big, I'm thinking the Bigelow House is in there, right? Yes. So is that not, that's included, isn't it? It's yes. in there. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Can you back up one slide, please? Sure. The vertical line that goes to the right of the horseshoe runs to the top of the page and goes between the word village uh, something district. It's just the full. Was that the actual district in 2011 at the time of the flood of Irene? No, that's, that's actually just a, a, a paper fold line. So in that case, where, where was the Montpelier end of the downtown designated? The dotted line there, Everett. Just there. beyond Batchelor Street. You see, this, this line right here comes up around, cuts across Main, cuts back across Batchelor, and starts heading north again. So that's the south extremity. Well, reason to my question, I own property at 112 Rear and 104. At the time, I talked to Steve Lockbeach, and he said I was not in that district. At the time, I told him he was incorrect, and it was tax credits which were given to, in due respect, Ed Steele, Chris Palamo, and the Davi Law Firm. And those were the tax credits that were given out. And I think I qualified the one who was told uh, inaccuracy, perhaps. At the time, it's not made me happy with it. But anyway, thank you for going back to that slide. Of course. So we went through this. So um, just a, a quick moment on, a, on another area um, that we added after spending some time in the district and driving around and um, looking at the properties. Uh, it, be, it became pretty clear to me we needed to look at this additional area that's highlighted in blue that's up on High Railroad and uh, Swayze. Uh, further north on Stowe, um, seemed to me that this neighborhood was fairly con continuous with the area I was looking at um, and that um, we ought to take another look at it and to see if it should be added to the survey. Um, I mean, it's, it, the buildings were of approximately the same age, anywhere from the, 19, you know, from the 1850s to the 1920s, roughly in that area. Um, was very dependent on the railroad. A lot of these areas, um, Eldridge um, Last Block Company was up on Railroad Street. A lot of the buildings were owned by the by that company. Uh, there was workers, housing, and so on. So I met with Devin Coleman about it, and he looked at it, and he said, "You know, we we definitely need um, to add this area to the village survey." And in fact, it wasn't sort of a question at that point of whether a um, we wanted to, or we didn't want to, he said, you have to, because the National Park Service, um, you need to f defend the boundaries when you send in the nomination of the National Park Service. And if they see this area, they're going to ask, well, why wasn't this area included? It's easy enough for them to look at Google Earth and drive down the street and see all these buildings that are apparently connected to the village that weren't in them, and they would have thrown it back. 
That's my understanding. So we would have ended up doing it uh, anyway. So I want to offer that I do appreciate the rapid turnaround of the village to, to so I could keep going on the project and include that area. There was no real hiccup or anything. I think a couple of days, and then uh, we're right back on it. But it did extend the contract period. So those are the streets on the left, approximately 46 more buildings. I think I counted too low, Steve, when we made the contract extension. But it's 46. OK. I have another question. When you opened your statement, you said you were going to add, you were going to put North uh, Union Street in. So South Union Street already is in, right? Because there's a lot of Correct. houses there. Correct. Okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Oh, at first, I thought you weren't having it. It's at all. right there, Kathy. No, no, I know, but I want to make sure I understood because when you spoke to begin with, it, it made it sound like that was the only part going to be put there. So. Yeah. Well, you can spread. You can see the north. <laughs> Sort of the purple is existing. Right. Uh, we, we looked initially at that upper part that's in green, and then we ended up adding that. that uh, it's one of the big pieces. reasons the trustees initiated this was the inequities we found after the Irene flooding that the hist houses in the historic district were exempted from being raised, right. whereas similar age houses not in the district weren't exempt. Yeah. And think so that this was a way to look at being equitable if you know the house is qualified there. So that's why the lower end of Union Street was you know particularly added when you know Steve brought that to our attention and the other end of South Main Street, yeah. you know, they would be exempt from being having to be raised. I had to apply separately for one of our houses to be on the register to get it exempt. Or determined to be eligible, right? Yes, I was eligible, but I, yeah. Yep. So we talked a little a bit about the areas that were added in the inside the original district. Never mind all those additional pieces, but what pieces did we look at that were sort of integral to Ms. Winters, 1978? And you can, um, so these are the pieces that we added. So the Hope Cemetery was added. Um, the full length of Adams Court, and I'm talking about the bottom left over there. Mm -hmm. This is all along, you know, I know the, the back of your hand to you folks, not necessarily to me, but... Um, and then uh, moving right, there's that piece of Parker Court mm -hmm. that we captured. Um, the next one um, off Main Street is, uh, that's the Warner Court. Right down there. there are only a couple of buildings down there. It turned out they didn't contribute. They were not considered historic buildings anyway, but... You know, it's important to know for planning purposes um, whether they are or whether they're not. Um, so we, it's good to survey them. And then again, uh, extended uh, Moody Court in this survey right to the end. So these pieces were just sort of uh, were, were left out of the original survey. The other thing you see here is the, the red boundary. That's the state hospital district. And I did not survey that. And the reason for that is it was um, listed on, as its own district in 2016, as, as you know, because they did a lot of work there um, in rehabbing that property after the flood. Several buildings were demolished, new buildings were constructed. And so part of the mitigation for the loss of those historic buildings was to nominate it to an individual nomination for the state hospital complex. Um, so I did not survey that area. It's its own district. But because it used to be in the village district um, as, you know, from 1978, it's still going to be part. The National Park Service, we asked them that question. What do we do with it? They said, you put its own boundary around it, but you will maintain it within the village historic district. So I think that was probably a good, uh, good, good outcome and one that Steve was kind of advocating for when we, when we talked about that. So the Fed agreed. And uh, just to clarify, yeah. Scott, uh, Batchelder Street was added as well, the, uh, across from the south entrance? Yes, that was added. The reason it doesn't have green around it is because that piece of Batchelder was included in the extension that I was originally right. given. Okay. Yeah. So that, that original extension right. went up Batchelder and then okay. went, went south. Okay. Yeah. That's good clarification. So November 8th, 16th, this was the new configuration of the state hospital complex. You probably most of you have seen this. And it has, they have their own numbers now from one through nine A. 
And so I'm taking that material and folding it into my nomination. I mean, it's quite a few pages, so just we'll be referencing it as opposed to including the whole thing. So just a little bit, again, we're talking about the mechanics of this survey, so you're really getting sort of behind the scenes look at what consultants are, are, are working on with this. And, you know, what do we use for a base map? I mean, for me and a lot of other preservation consultants, it's all about the mapping. If you don't have a clear map, people are really never going to understand uh, what you've done. They won't be able to find their properties, and it's not as valuable for planning. So I got the, uh, the one on the top left uh, map from uh, BCGI. And I said, well, do you have anything that's a little clear because those footprints are, they're not really rectangular. I think that's an automated process where there's a, a computer program that outlines those buildings, and that's why they're not square. And then they sent me this one on the right. And I said, well, you know, that's, you know, that might be an improvement, but it really doesn't include all the garages, and a lot of those footprints are out of date. So really, and then I got this one from the town. Um, so this has footprints as well. I mean, the footprints are great on this. A couple of issues, though, with, with this one. Um, by the time I got finished putting my data on it, it would have been so busy, you wouldn't have wanted to read it with all the parcel lines on it. And secondly, Steve, I what date was this? Or do you remember? Uh, I think it was done in the early 90s. Early 90s. Yeah. So there are a number of changes, and I would have had to make Sort of like, like do another overlay and change a ton of footprints on that one and somehow take out the, you know, it's, so I really had no base map to work from. Oh, shucks, you know, what am, what am I going to do? Um, so I ended up making one um, almost out of, out of whole cloth. And that's, this is, I mean, that's just a screenshot, so it's not very clear. I'll show you how clear it is on the next slide. But that's the general shape of the current district, and it includes the south extension of Union, it includes all the buildings, excuse me, north on Union, south along Main Street River Road. Um, as you can see, it still includes the state office complex, um, and it includes the area up to the east, you know, the High Street and Railroad. Road. And I've been over this map and the boundaries with, uh, with the state, and they're good to go. They said, this is, this is what we want to see. Uh, we like the map. We like the clarity of the map. A few things have been added that were not there. As so I talked about, you know, the four courts, the buildings on those. We added the cemetery. We added the uh, um, the park. Rusty Parker Park is now a, a property instead of just a park, so it's described. And the shaded properties are not contributing, and the unshaded properties uh, are considered historic. So this is a draft. Now, the state is going to go over this with the photographs in May. And they'll say, you know, they may ask for more information. They may say, I don't agree. It's, it's possible. These are, these are my uh, determinations you, thus far. You just mentioned four courts? Yeah, the four, court, the four court streets. Oh, court yeah, the four streets. little streets all called courts. Yeah. yeah, sorry. So those are all in there. I mean, as an example, you can see. Uh, Right above the papers, there's that little Warner yep. right there with the two there. Um, but the way it's showing here, those show as white, but they're black, actually. I think it's just the numbers in them that make them look. And you can see um, Adams Court over there and Union Street. So they're all, they're all now included. So it's a lot of contributing. I don't think I had much more to say about, about that. So you said the, the dark shaded ones are non-contributing? Correct. Yep. All right. Um, so where did I get these footprints? So I got them from Google Maps, um, a lot of them, and I was able just to trace open. This is a to scale map, which is actually is another thing that's kind of unusual in historic district maps. Normally they're like this, drawn um, as sort of a conceptual map. But this one here is actually to scale. Um, the footprints of the buildings aren't exact, but they're they're nice. you know they're they're fairly close. Um, but the map is a hybrid of several maps that I put together. And a lot of those footprints I drew in just by going to the property. Is there a garage? What's its location? Um, so bottom line, this map, ideally, you know, did I miss any? We're gonna we're gonna go over that. 
but it includes everything except the garden shed in the village of Waterbury is listed here. And each, each building described as historic or not historic. And I'll show you some pictures later of some of the garages we looked at. Did I miss one? Well, what about the properties on the south side of Randall Street? Oh, this is just a screenshot. They're all in there. Oh, okay. Yeah. They'll all right. Do you want to? <laughs> I don't want to make you nervous. There they are. <laughs> all right. OK. Yeah. So I really just took a snip yeah, of that map just to show the, uh, to show the clarity. So you can see here. Uh, so here's 270. And you look up 270 in the text, it gives you the address and a property description. And it, its garage, for whatever reason, is not considered historic. 272's garage is, so is 274's, and so on. And obviously, 275's is. Can you go back? You have again? two 270's. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You have two neighboring 270's. Uh, why do I have that? On there on that I don't one? know, but I think I corrected that in the actual map. 269. Yeah. I think I corrected that in the actual map. This is kind of an older screenshot. Did you want me to go back here? Yes. I'm trying to find the park, where the park is. Rusty Parker Park? Yeah. Right. Let me make a note of that. So the house is, across, the house is on the corner. So the ones that are all black in there, is that the motel? What used to be the motel? Well, there's the shopping center, which is the cluster of Yeah, I see that. That's across buildings. from it. Crab Moody Court, that's the Washington County Mental Health Building. It's no, she's really talking about um, across the south side. I'm talking south. about the Gateway Motel and the yeah. two other Gateways. Gateway. Yeah. yeah, those are all shaded in, so the motels are reconstruction of oh, original. Oh, so because they, they I guess they were made to put it back the way it used to be yeah. in the front, so I was No, they weren't made to do that. Huh? They weren't required to oh, do I thought that. they just, I thought, I heard That's they, they offered to reconstruct the front okay, well, good. building. Yeah, that was their okay. offer. The, um, this space that we're here is not shade and dark. Jane's house, I know, would be historic. But yeah, well, we, we, I'm not going to split a building in half, oh. saying which is contributing and which is not. If there is a um, historic front part of the house, then that whole block gets um, get yes, shaded white. Otherwise, I mean, it, it would be unbearably complex for me and for you. There's more of that than meets the eye. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, this it's one's pretty obvious. Okay. Particularly in right, Waterbury, because there are yeah. so many buildings that have multiple extensions going back. Yeah. Um, okay, that's yeah. makes sense. So, but thank you for the 270. I, I think I got that, but I made a note of it just in case. So anyway, to, to show you detail what the map looks like. And because this is a digital map, this is the way to look on your computer. I mean, you can zoom right in, and the clarity gets better as you zoom in because it's digital. So that was for uh, mapping. So what about data? Like, uh, I got this the top sheet from the town. I hope that's not proprietary. And then uh, I converted that for my use on the right, showing um, this is what I used out in the field. If folks saw me out there with clipboard for week after week. So noting what the materials were for the roof, walls, windows, foundation features, and you know, did I get my photos? And the reason I do this and not from photos is because it's really hard to tell sometimes wood shingles from, from asbestos siding in a photograph, and hardy plank from wood. And so some of these things you really need to note. And a brick foundation may just be visible in, in just you know, a 10-foot section that you're not going to see in a photo. So you want to try and find those things. Um, when you're on site. And that's the way it, it looks um, when I'm out in the field trying to uh, take notes in traffic. And you know, as I put this on here, I did notice one thing. I put a little smiley face in that block, which I saw. <laughs> and there's, a, there's an actual reason for that. Um, because it says two over, two over two wood with four light wood storm windows on there. And I was pretty happy to see some original windows with some original storms. And so that's how that little happy face ended up there. Because there's a lot of vinyl window replacement in Waterbury, as you all know. Uh, what about photos? So I took about 1,500 photos in, in the district. Uh, they're all digital. I've uh, got them all um, categorized here. So you can see, for example, in the top right, again, this is just a screenshot. Um, two Elm Street. One, two, so seven pictures at least of two elm, and then what another six or seven or no more than that of three elm. 
Um, and those are all, you can see the sizes of the images, they're all between 3,000, 7,000, 8,000. So they're pretty high resolution images. So, I, you know, the town will take, take possession um, of all these. So you'll have 1,500 images all um, cataloged by street address and also about another 100 streetscape uh, images. And you can see them there on the bottom here. So I think this is a really good snapshot of 2018 uh, monitoring. So what ends up in the, we're not putting 1,500 photographs in the <laughs> National <laughs> Register nomination. Um, there are 305 properties now instead of 187. So we'll end up with, I don't know, 400, 400 photographs total, sort of, because the way I've arranged it is I have, some of these may get cut by Devon in the state. So I got a nice picture of a house and then maybe a, a detail of a house uh, close up. So this is the difference between 1978 and 2018, what we do for photographs. So you can see that in the old nomination, there were only 35 photographs for 187 buildings. That's because in those days, I guess it was expensive. You had to print them out and so on. So they would take them in gangs of three and four instead of individually. Mm -hmm. uh, and they all get printed on glossy 8 by 10s I'm old enough that I did one of these, printing the 8 by 10s And it was painful. You really wanted to get that photo right before you had it printed. Um, so, but we're not, we're not in that box anymore. So yeah, I put, we'll have like 375 to 400 digital color photographs in the nomination of this one. I think this is 32 Randall, just kind of an example. We try to get the house as a three-quarter angle. So we try to get one the long side and the short side. And if the porch wraps around, we try to get where it wraps around, not the other side. And again, some details that, that we'll include. Uh, so in the top two, we've got a couple of architectural details. You know, I think both of those are on Randall Street. In the left, you've got this gazebo backdrop by mountains. By the way, it seems like everything is backdrop by mountains in Waterbury. At the end of every street, there's a mountain. <laughs> right, out, right out the window, in fact. Everywhere you look, the backdrop is a mountain. It's, and it really makes it uh, sure a happy face fantastic. There. And you can certainly see that here. There's one there, there's one there, there's one there. Um, so the curved turret, does that belong to anybody here? Is that okay? okay. <laughs> you know, what's really impressive to me is they looked, am I right, they're curved sash up on the top of the that. The glass is curved yeah. underneath as well. Wow. There's flat storm windows there, but underneath the original windows are curved. It's curved. Yeah. Big you happy face. You can see just the very top windows. Yeah. Pretty rare. Pretty I, rare. I only found one other, I traveled a lot, I only yeah. found one other Turret that has curved glass. Most of them have been replaced with flat yeah, glass. Yep. One in St. John's where it's got curved glass as well. And I hunted and hunted trying to find more. <laughs> no. Well, pretty, I hope it's okay if we include it. I mean, it's okay. really an impressive feature. And the scallop shingles and the conical roof with the finial and, you know, the whole thing is. And that gazebo backdrop by that beautiful uh, sort of mountain scene again of Randall. Um, how many pictures are there of, of the commercial center of Waterbury? Are there like 100,000? I don't know, but they're everywhere. So we'll add a few more. And this is on Winooski Street. What these are, you know, go back to the uh, mid 19th century, these two houses. And there's just not a lot of eaves front building in uh, Waterbury. And by eaves front, I mean the long side. Most of the gables show. You see, all these are all gable. Front. These two are eaves, usually a much older house, a federal style from 1850s, 1860s, um, and just like just beautifully preserved. So again, that's kind of a nice streetscape type shot that we can show. So that's kind of it for photos. So what about the building description? So I'm showing you one, a description of this building. So that's how it was described in uh, 78, and this is how I described it in 18. So. Again, was there some helpful stuff in the 78? Guys, sometimes some of the historical data was important, like who lived here or something like mm -hmm. that. As far as the descriptions go, those are redid those from scratch because so much had changed. Um, not particularly in this one. And that's one of the questions I had for you, Skip, is who lived in that house? It was so impressive. But I've got a whole list. Um, Isn't that the state, the one they stayed off of home? They just sold it. Yeah. yeah. They just sold it? Dr. Grout's house. Hmm. Oh boy, there you go. Dr. Grout? Originally. He ran the hospital oh. and he, 
when it was built. Okay. I mean, some of the houses are just so impressive, you know, that it was a sort of a, uh, the doctors, the lawyer, and the business tycoons, and then there's some fantastic workers housing in other places. So that was just to give you a, um, and here's kind of a, a standard description for a, a smaller building. And I guess I don't need to do this now because I don't have an easel or a chalkboard, but what I can do is sort of break down a description like this to, sh to, to relate it to a building. You don't need to be an architecture student or have any great grasp of architecture to, to figure these out. Uh, most of the ones I've done, standard form, they start wood frame. How many stories? Gable front, we talked about that. Gable front is sim only means when this is facing the street instead of that piece. Uh, side hall plan, just means the doors are on the side instead of in the center. A duplex, we know that. Clapboard siding, asphalt shingled roof, it's got a ridge chimney. Uh, facade porch has Tuscan columns. Tuscan just means round. Uh, in entasis, that sounds fancy. All that means is they taper at the top. So it's, it's really, you know, it sounds more complicated than it is. And they rest on a shingled half wall, which is the case with half of the villages. The posts come down, they rest on kind of a solid railing that's shingled or sided. Um, the clad corner boards rise to meet open eaves, decorate. So open eaves means there's not a box around your soffit, it just means they're open. And verge board means that fancy trim that goes down the, the eaves, what, maybe half a dozen houses? And, Waterbury gingerbread. Yeah, gingerbread. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> gingerbread. Um, exposed rat. So all of these things. I will, so the exercise that I plan to do. There's not time to do it today. I'm going to take this and I'm going to draw the house based on that description mm -hmm. and see how close we actually come to the house, which is that. Mm -hmm. Now I have seen it before, but I'm going to really plain Jane show you how we come up with that house uh, from that description. There's no magic. And There's final signing on that house. It doesn't disqualify it, huh? No. No, I mean, it really, it, it sort of depends. If it's lost everything, plus an addition, plus, yeah, then, yeah. So some of the garages that we, that we looked at, again, none of this was included in, in your last nomination. So the two on the top are considered non-contributing. I mean, there have been too many changes, and you can't really read what that was. Even though that's kind of got a cool gambrel roof, it probably had you know uh, an actual hay door and then maybe some wood doors down below. Um, this one on the bottom left, you know, that's got a pyramidal hip roof. It's got these exposed rafter tails. It's got its original two bays. Now it's missing its doors, right? But that's not enough to disqualify it. I mean, we're not these sort of hardcore purists about this. If you can more or less read what it was, and this, you know, it's fairly intact, we're going to err on the side of including it. Um, we're, not, we're, not in, we're here to include, not to exclude properties. And then the white, right, uh, bottom right, this is the one that, that makes my, my original pitter pass. It's just got it all. I mean, I hope that they understand how rare that is at 27 North Main. Wood siding, a four over four historic window, eave returns, freeze board, corner boards. It's got the original uh, six light over wood panel doors. I mean, it's a peach. Um, it's, just, it's just great. And there are, there are several like that, but that may be the best example. So could you bring these two back? Could you make those eligible? You know, I get that question a lot. Well, if it's not eligible, can I make it eligible? You could. You, for that one, I mean, depending, I'm not exactly sure how old that one is, but if you put clapboard siding back on it and then put a decent door, you know, would we have considered it historic? Yeah, you probably would have. Probably would have erred on the side of... of but Scott, if you tear a building down and you rebuild it to the more or less original design, that's not... You can't list it, can you? Like the Gateway Motel is an example, where they rebuilt it to the measured drawings of what it was, yeah. more or less. So that's a good question, Steve. I talk about that in the description of the gateway. I said, you know, give this building more time to sort of settle into its new skin. Mm -hmm. um, it really was a nice, faithful reconstruction of the building. And I, I think it could be relisted as eligible, but it's too soon right too now. Soon. Okay. Yeah, you want to give it at least 10 years for a building. It's a little different for a bridge, because a bridge is, is important for its engineering, which you can reconstruct faithfully. Like, mm -hmm. With cover bridges and so on. Skip, what was the original motel? Oh, we're behind. Historically. Oh, 
The original the hotel. Was that? What was the gateway originally? Where it burned? I mean, what was this original? Was it a famous well, person's it house or? Well, yeah, well, it was William Wells. William Wells. And then George Randall owned it later. So here's another thing that uh, I'm going to try and speed this up right away, 10 to 4. I'm, I'm getting through this. Um, so okay. these are buildings from the late 1950s to 1965, and they were excluded from the 1978 nomination. I included them in this one as being um, eligible for the National Register. This is a mid-century called minimal traditional style post-war construction, and although it's not you know, it's got uh, really sort of ornately architectural. It has some distinct elements. It's sort of like the ranch size, the, the gabled roofs that sometimes intersect, small dormers. The corner window, on, one on the bottom left, is kind of a unique feature of this style. Um, these, and if you notice, one thing they all have in common is they have one bay entrance uh, hoods on posts, most of them space. Sometimes they're cantilevered. And that's another distinct element. Um, there is one, one of these, I think it may be five. I think it's, I have to look back in the, in the nomination, still has its original steel divided windows. So that's an important feature of that. Very few have those uh, left. I've, you know, I've seen some in New York. But I mean to go back to that property and, and make sure that they're steel before I say they're steel. And if they are, again, I sure hope that they don't get changed, but you know, not everybody who lives in a property either knows or necessarily cares that those that those windows are a really unique feature from the mid '60s and that helped define the the character of that building. So it's kind of a new take on on what most people would see as sort of fairly modest uh, structures. Um, I've got a page uh, printed of this. I'd love to leave it with you because I. I'd really appreciate it if, if you had time to go over it. Um, this kind of, uh, again, in the top, you can see the total property surveyed, 178 then, 305 now, plus, I don't know, the 40 garages. The breakdown then, they only had nine non-contributing. Um, today, out of the 305, it's 56. That number may get tweaked a little bit when the state looks at it, up or down. Uh, sort of hard to say. These are the demolitions here. I don't know if I got them all. Um, I mean, I certainly know what's there now, but sometimes it's, it's a little difficult to say every building demolished. And a couple of them don't have addresses, like 84A. Yeah, we can help, help you by reviewing that maybe before it goes to the state. Great. And then the buildings, uh, the next box down is the buildings that have lost integrity, so they've been changed substantially since the original nomination. So I, they were included then, but not included now. Um, and again, I've got that printout here to leave you. Is that um, because of the interiors? No, we don't. No, everything do I do is from inside anybody's house. No, no, everything I do is from the uh, is from the right of way, the public right of way. So that's why when you see a picture of the back of a house or of its barn, they may be a little hidden or this or that. It's because I don't walk down the driveway and take a picture of it. Uh, my job is to stay in the public right away. To, to, I have a question about why the LaRocks house was one of the ones not included on South Main Street because the original part of that house was built the same time as the um, houses on Swayze Court. In 1960s? The 1960s? The, the numbers 142, right? My street address is 142. The house was built in 52. Okay. For the 2009 edition put on. I think that's what this called. Was it shaded? Was it black? Did I have it shaded out? In yeah. The, I oh, so. Okay. It was hard for me to get a close look, but I think yeah. I'm, I think I'm shaded. I'll be happy to take a take a look at it with you. Um, if we can do it after, or, or sure, we can look at it. Take I can take a second look. Yep. Um. I've already got a printout, Steve, of all the building descriptions. So I'm going to leave you with a copy of the map, okay. the full-size map, all the building descriptions, and this sheet. So this is if, you know, if and when you all had time to look it over sort of to kind of proof that, because that's really sort of the nuts and bolts of, of this going forward. So what's the status and what's the timeline? So this is what's done. Uh, let's start at the top. The mapping is done. Just doing final review. Going to make sure about that 270. Uh, mm -hmm. Building descriptions done. 
final review. Photographs are complete. The historic intro is at 80%, uh, and, the, and the statement of significance are 80%. So those are two pieces of text um, that go with the National Register nominee. One's sort of like a brief history of Waterbury, and the second one is, you know, why, is, why are these buildings uh, significant in the National Register status? Um, I don't really have much left. And it says form 60%. Well, that's only because, you know, when these pieces are done, they just, they make up the form, which is really not a, not a big deal. I just, I need to have them completely finished. When you have a, a duplex, uh, two owners, do you list those as two separate buildings? I, I'm asking that because uh, 270 and 270A might be the duplex that's beside me. Oh. I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave that one with you. <laughs> I mean, I think each building gets a number uh, lefty, and I think that that was, it's probably 269. But I think a, a duplex that's a side by side, even with separate owners, I think it's just one structure for historic it's, designation. It's, it's going to show as one structure on my map, but uh, and it's going to have one number. But when you look at the 911 address, it'll say 15 slash 17. So you'll be able to tell which ones are duplexes that way. As far as the owner and who gets notified before the listing, um, we'll try to notify both. Yeah, yeah, we'll work on that. Yeah. So that's kind of the status of where things are. So what's Steve? You asked about the timeline. Yep. If I could bring that, and I spoke to the state this morning just to double check on things. Okay. So the full draft of DHP, uh, May 21. So, so that's. Hopefully I can work it out with Skip to meet you <laughs> to come with my list of questions. Um, and, and whomever else would want to sort of round table it again, because I've got a list of um, questions. The next thing that once that is approved, you know, it, it runs through the, you've looked at it, uh, Devin has looked at it, and we all, everybody says it's a go. It gets posted online by the division on June 26th. That same day, the letters go out to the property owners, and uh, it will show them where to go to look at the nomination because they you're asked for your concurrence. Um, the only way you get listed in the National Register is if you agree. It's not like the state register. The state register just gets a listing, but the national um, requires a, a properties uh, property so are you, owner. Are you permission. saying that once you finish your work and submit it, that usually it's accepted? Yeah, the nomination will be accepted, but you know some properties, if the owner objects, yeah, I, I got that part, don't need to be. But the nomination itself will, will go in, okay. unless every single property owner in Waterbury says no. But there are a lot of advantages. I mean, particularly for commercial buildings with tax credits and so on, and you can get a very cool plaque to put on your property with the date this building, you know, is listed in the National Register of Historic Places by the National. It's it's that's pretty cool. Um, so the next thing happens is the the, um, the review by the uh, Vermont Advisory Council. That's sort of the last state step before it goes to the federal government. Um, and you can see that that June is a month before. So they need that draft posted a month before their meeting. That's why those dates line up. And then the submittal to the Park Service goes on or about um, August 17th. And then the final listing several months later October 30th. I was surprised actually it would be this fall. I was thinking it was going to be the spring, but it would be this fall. Yeah, Devin thought by the end of the year that was yeah. his prediction, but this is a little more ambitious, which is I, kind of I think it may be a little ambitious, but that's what I, you know, he says follow this timeline, which we will, uh, that's where we end up. So in the end, with it all being accepted, does it, does Waterbury or the village have one incorporated report? you know, the 1978 standing and then this 2018 yeah. standing, does it sort of mesh together or are they float around separately? The, uh, well, the 1978 listing kind of goes away. This supersedes it. So this incorporates yep. everything yep. and supersedes it. But you still have, you'll still have two kind of listings. You'll have this one and you'll have the one for the state hospital complex, which mm -hmm. is incorporated in. So, I mean, so if you want more information on the state hospital complex, you're going to have to go to that other listing. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's referenced. But this update really does bring everything. Into it's a life. package deal, yeah. right? It, it supersedes the '78 and incorporates the. Right. the and it all looks hospital. a little different because if you see the d descriptions and the pictures of the 1978 properties, 
they'll read and look a little different than. Yeah. Oh, it's valuable different. to keep. I mean, those 35 images are great to, to keep. Mm -hmm. um, they're a record of their time. Yeah. Oh. And it's amazing how much has changed uh, in some of the properties. I mean, a couple of things that really hit me about the change is one of the windows. Um, there must have been a vinyl window manufacturer nearby, or mm -hmm. because. Uh, the, the one over one vinyl replacement windows are every even on high style buildings. They're often their buildings have been changed to one over one. Over. I'm not making any judgment call. I'm just noting noting that fact. And another big change has been the um, the loss of uh, wood siding. Oh, let me show you one real quick. I know we're sort of like, this is just uh, these are you know an example of, of some of the, the thing I can show you at the public meeting. You know the Waterbury Inn, and then the 1970s bank, which yeah. Devin Coleman really loved that. Yeah, he said, Rock and Embassy. if that was still here, I would have advocated for that building being historic. <laughs> <laughs> and then the way it looks today. Um, and that this is a really lovely restoration in this building when it was like this was converted to, you know, it's a housing project, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, 93, 94. I mean, they, they, uh, it's extraordinary. They put back these uh, door hoods with the brackets and the coins and the corner boards, and that's just the whole thing, pretty remarkable. And then here's sort of another uh, uh, one, two, three, and this is also on my list for Skip at some point. The bottom left, I'm not sure with the date, but there's a little railroad car there. <laughs> these are all showing where the, uh, the Conti buildings yeah. were, yeah. right? Thank you. Yep. Yep. And if you can make it out, it's a little bit blurry. I'm not sure what that was. It could have been a little, uh, a little, little diner or a little repair shop or something. That building burned. That's why it had to be put back differently. Oh, yeah. Oh, these, yeah, both of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The Conti building with the brown building, that burned. Yeah. To the ground. Get it. So that's, you know, that's one of my, you know, the, the, what year it burned, and again, that's on my list, and then, you know, here's what's there today. And this is just a quick example of the, you can't see it all that well, but if you look at the detail on the walls of that building, left, it's got, you know, these sunburst patterns and scalloped and sawn shingles, and uh, it's got this scalloped pattern, slate roof, and so on. And then today, it's a little dark, this is really unique. That's called East Lake style decoration. It's still there, but pretty much everything else is gone. You know, the brackets and all of the, the slate roof and the woodwork. Or is it underneath the vinyl? Yeah, I suspect there are quite a few houses in Waterbury that are going to get some big surprises when they pull off their vinyl siding. And maybe they're going to find this stuff. Because it's not necessarily that, that stuff was in bad condition. Vinyl was just simply in vogue, you know, in style. Yeah, the but, uh, Perkins Parker funeral home had a big, uh, like a big hex sign under the vinyl. I got a picture of it. When oh, is that right? I did it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> big hex symbol. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, again, I, you know, I'll add a couple more for the next meeting. But you know, here's a again, you can see the one over one vinyl um, windows in here. Again, it, you, you'll see it. On, it seems like 80 percent of the buildings, maybe 90 percent. But look up in the gables sometimes. Yeah, yeah, they don't change the gable window because nobody's living up there. Nobody has to open and close it. So you can often see what the historic window looks like by looking up in the gable. So there you've got a nice double hung four over four true divided light wood sash window, which is kind of cool that it's still there. Um, and then I think this is my last slide. I'm not sure I got, I, I'm pretty sure we were going to be running late by the time I got here, which we are, so I didn't really put a lot on here. I would say about the vinyl siding, it might be interesting um, at some point to see a demonstration project in Waterbury where it comes off, because other towns have done that. I've seen there are a number of buildings on Winooski Street, for example, that used to have asbestos siding. That's gone. So there must have been a program to remove it at some point. There's a lot of wood siding, and then when I read the 1978 nomination, it says uh, asbestos shingles. Um, I am predicting that at a certain point, a real estate agents are going to have, there's going to be some trouble with vinyl sided buildings once it's been on for 30, 40, 50 years with some suspect about what's underneath. Because vinyl is very good at keeping water out. It's also very good at keeping it in. And you don't want that water trapped in the building and play havoc with the, with the building. So forget about the historical side of it, purely practical. Um, and if you look at the Preservation Trust newsletter last year, 
I wrote a piece on how to, how to remove it, how to check it to see what you've got underneath. Very few modern intrusions, great use of back lots to extend buildings as opposed to going out the sides. Um, the residents, incredibly helpful and friendly. I mean, not everybody likes having photographs taken in your house, let's face it. Um, I only ran into one instance where somebody really gave me a pretty hard time about photographing their, their building. So I did it on the other side of the street. Um, again, there's a lot of, I talked about the one on the uh, vinyl windows and the siding and so on. So, I, you know, I've got some sort of more general notes that I can cover about that because if and when the, the next meeting happens, uh, Steve, I'm not going over the mechanics of the survey, how I made the map. Yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> but I, I thought for you all, you'd want to see that. I have a question about windows, though. Sure. Because, like, we had an energy audit done on our brick house after the flood, and one of the things they recommended was window replacement because we had the weighted ones. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, and and so that meant that all those cavities around them were empty, which you had a lot of heat loss. Yeah. So we replaced the downstairs, mm -hmm. but not the upstairs. Now we were going to do that, but we replaced them with wood replacements. We did replace them. So is that better than vinyl, I'm supposing, but not as good as trying to do something with the originals, correct? You know, um, it, it, often it's not really so much about the material, it's more about the, the appearance and the design. We kept the I same. Mean, yeah, uh, you there. know, it, look, uh, everything in, in Vermont was made to look like something else. Half the stuff we've got here was made to imitate stone, and it's wood or, or terracotta. So the, the fact that it's one material instead of another, it's a lot about the, uh, the design and the color and the appearance. Often, you know, the bright white windows are a little bit distracting on some of the high style, sort of richly decorated buildings. You know, that's true, I'll just say it. Um, can they be painted? Sure, they absolutely can. But again, I make no judgment about them. Um, well, for us too, with these big, I live in three houses on South Main Street, and they're very high, and I can't get out there and clean the windows and take the storms off anymore, so yeah. the tip-in wooden sure. windows were a lot better replacement for yeah. a lot of people, I think. You know? yeah. I mean, if you're really fond, if you've got really nice wood windows, you can put in new tracks and have them spring-loaded. I mean, you can do things like that, too. Uh, I'm sort of at the end. Um, well, let's wrap it up. I think that's great, Scott. Thank you for the presentation. We'll, yes. we'll be hearing more. I think unless anybody has any other questions, we should move on to the rest of your meeting. Yeah. Sorry about taking so long. I know I'm dragging no, along. I think you're fine. Um, and there may be a third meeting prior to the public meeting because we're hopefully the village is going to go away and after uh, you know the 30th of June so it's the select board will be the responsibility and you know one of the things is talking with them do they want a briefing similar to this yeah. that they weren't involved in getting it started and things so that sure, I they would be up to date and then uh, you know, when the final decision comes, it's the select board, uh, you know, would be responsible for with all the zoning and things, so. Will it still be the uh, Waterbury Village District, regardless of? Well, I think uh, we'll call it probably Waterbury Village District, but okay. it's, yeah, we still have a village. It's just yeah. not going to be. Okay, that's valley. fine. Just want to make sure I, I didn't have to change any names. Well, I don't know. That's <laughs> my thought. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, it it, it won't have any governmental. Right, okay, yeah. Well, this doesn't say Waterbury Village, Inc. on it anyway, so. Right, yeah. But it's been very helpful. I appreciate that. Thank you, trustees, for funding that, too, and getting that done. So you support the listing? Sorry. You're darn right. I think, I think South Main like Street's it. a beautiful part of town, and I've said that a million times. Well, that was the implication, you know, when we, hey, that house is built, before this one, but yeah, Especially the the have have so. yes. Thank you very much. I, I think so. So here is the. Uh, I'll look at the dot. Oh, yeah. Because I'm gonna get a certain things I'm gonna leave behind. Maybe I can get her 20% off. Okay. So that's the list of the 20% if you rebuild your part. And we can take a date next it's week. I don't know that. Sure. Yeah. I have got to get me some water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're going to, there's a lot of things that can get out of that. That's why you've got to take it carefully. Yeah. yeah. 
treasure yourself. You can't be that much of a treasure if you didn't well, get him out two years ago. There's something yeah. that's kind of in there. What kind of car? An Essex Coupe. Underneath the tree, there's an Essex Coupe for a rumble seat. John, and they got a whole that. bunch of stuff for it. Got to go here. Um, next up on the agenda was the update on the uh, charter change um, approval with the legislature and uh, Paul Giuliani, uh, you know, and we met with the legislative council and the two Waterbury representatives last week to go over some language and to kind of clarify what um, was intended and we agreed to some changes that I think they've made to the um, the proposal and things. Um, they clarified uh, that the village was accepting its property and assets and liabilities of the current village would go to the district. It said shall, um, you know, retain the uh, assets and liabilities they'd also uh, we agreed to take out the option to expand the district um, that the boundaries would be fixed at the current village and there wouldn't be an option to um, expand those as had been included in the past and uh, also uh, the village would have the option to add a property tax to maintain its properties and things, uh, the current uh, physical assets that we own. Water and sewer monies have to be kept separately and can only be spent on those facilities. But if we wanted to maintain or make repairs to Rusty Parker Park or the Elm Street parking lot or do something down by the ice center, we would have to find other than water and sewer funds to do that. And if we wanted to, there could be a tax assessed um, to do those improvements. It all come through the budget process at the uh, annual village meeting, which I think would be in May is when we put it. So the process would be much the same. You know, the voters would have to approve the budget and, you know, if there was a tax to generate those funds. So. Um, I think, you know, it's optimistic that those are in agreement, and if the committee agrees with those, then it would be uh, passed out of the Government Operations Committee and go to the full House for approval and then over to the Senate. And, um, both Tom and Teresa have said that all the discussions on these things happens in the House, that the Senate is more of a formality that they let the House do all of the uh, discussions and things. So um, I think by the end of the session, we're hopeful that it's all passed. And Paul Giuliani has been very helpful with the Legislative Council in explaining, you know, what was intended in the language and things that perhaps when Bill and I were there in the past, you know, they didn't really take our explanation as um, they didn't pay attention <laughs> yes so. what about the discussion that was in the paper from the man who lives next to the wireworks who was worried did that not to anything nothing yeah because it didn't make any sense to me because he's going to have more say now than he would have if it he didn't show up again and i don't think he gave him any language and it really wasn't germane to what we were doing okay yes Anne. So if the sale of 51 South Main goes through after the charter change, where does that money go? It's up to the district commissioners to set it aside. It has nothing to do with water and sewer. So it would sort of go into the village? The village accounts, yes. yes. You know, we have a tax stabilization fund and we have the UDAG money. So um, we've said that those would be continued in the same way that they have. Um, I would suspect that we would put it in with a tax stabilization money. Um, that, you know, unless you have a tax, it isn't really necessary and things. And that would be funds that we could use for non-water and sewer related purposes. Right. And the maintenance so. that you talked about charging for. Pardon? It could be used as a maintenance budget yes. versus a property. 
Yes. I thought we were away from them. Perfect. <laughs> where do those Where do those two funds stand roughly right now? Let, is that public knowledge? Is it public knowledge? Well, the the um, tax stabilization fund is probably four hundred thousand dollars or so. Uh, the UDAG fund, the total assets are about 1.6 million. Okay. Um, about uh, 950 thousand of that is lent out, and yeah. then the balance is available in cash, mostly in investments. In the committee a couple weeks ago, and things wanted a copy of our audit that showed where all those funds are maintained, and that the water and sewer. Uh, funds and budgets are all separate and things, so they were really, you know, wanted to see that that's actually state law that you can't, you know, water and sewer are proprietary funds and you can't, you know, use them to do with it. So. Do you expect to have an answer in this legislative session? Yes. Oh. Yep. Yep. I attended the Down Street event last week who Tom Stevens is a friend of for the fifth year, Fanny Pelletier who was fortunate to be the cancer survivor. And I asked a question as to, and I know Bill's probably not going to agree with me, but that's not the first time. Uh, when the Housing Vermont relinquished responsibility, if that's the right term, of Stimson Graves and the seminary building in the center, particularly Stimson Graves, which I recall being involved with, at that point in time, that loan should have been paid off and Down Street should have renegotiated with the trustees for a similar loan, which I think was $217,000, correct me if I'm wrong, for 30 years with no interest. And uh, Eileen indicated that it was approved by Down Street's attorney, and she said by the town attorney. Maybe she said town versus village, but I, my question is, uh, and talking with Lefty about it, maybe with you as well so at some point, uh, I don't recall any legal uh, information that were being in the minute, minutes of meetings, whether anybody representing the village agreed to that situation. And she said the other night, that's all she knew about it, that the town attorney and Down Street's attorney concurred that they didn't have to worry about that. The cost of transitioning Stimson Graves in the seminary building was $324,000. I have those figures. Uh, I have an extra copy if anybody wants one. Um, in fact, I have two extra copies. And their financial report, and they had uh, cash available, something like $860,000, I think it was. So my point being, we would not have been doing anything negative to their organization or to the continuation of Stimson Graves and Seminary Building if the trustees had had the opportunity to renegotiate, maybe with the same terms, or maybe not. Hmm. But uh, I think that's something that needs to be looked at and find out just what the, what the truth is, because... Is it 30 years gone by? No. Close though, right? Well, that's not the question. The question is, when it changed from Downing Vermont to Downing Streets. Yeah. I don't know, Everett, and I don't know if Lefty remembers, but we can certainly, you know, look into that, and if it's legally required, address it, and if it isn't, you know, we'll have to deal with what, you know, the documents say at the time, so. And as village meeting minutes or the village report. Well, there, Tyler has those, the official ones, so that's where it would be, is, you know, if it was yeah, in the there. Loan documents, too. Bill, when was that loan done? I thought he just said it was 79 or something. No, no, no it's really oh. uh, early 90s. Uh, 92, I believe. Yeah. So, we can look into that <laughs> later. <laughs> Uh, next up on the agenda was um, discussion about 51 South Main Street that I put on here um, that we had talked at the last meeting about, uh, you know, the cost of having it, you know, demolished and things and whether or not we've also kicked around the possibility of subdividing the lot, how much does uh, parking, um, that Chris Parsons would need and whether that would be 
room enough to subdivide and things. Um, so I put on here, um, you know, I drafted up some things for an RFP to go out to have uh, both uh, Woody and Alec Tuscany to look at the RFP and maybe bring it back to the trustees at, um, you know, our next meeting in May to kind of approve going out and also to have Steve or whoever is to take a look at what Chris Parsons has proposed and how many parking spaces would he need and how could that be, uh, you know, addressed on the lot and what it would leave, you know, left over and whether that's feasible to look into subdividing that and possibly selling that to the town and, um, you know, selling the other part to Chris Parsons there. So I've put together some things. Also, uh, another party has come forward and expressed an interest in looking at um, 51 South Main Street, perhaps, um, you know, reusing it as is the building and things. Um, you know, whether that's an option. I know uh, Zeb Town is here today. I think, you know, he's looked into it with um, his wife and things. I don't know if you'd like to say a few words about what you were looking at or not. Um, you yeah, know, I. Um, yeah. Go You can introduce yourself for the camera and the. I'm Zip Town. You're not here as the dog catcher today. No, not today. <laughs> Thank goodness. Um, He's well, a good one. I can exist. <laughs> we were thinking of mean it like keep the bill and to see if it's uh, what could be saved. Um, and maybe like fill in the basement, so that's not there, but keeping what the building looks like, using the most. I saw there were some old uh, lamps um, when we went through a little tour um, that were originally on the building that were gas that were turned to lights, and I think the ice would bust them off. That would be cool to get back on the outside. Um, Nina shop, the flower shop would be in the, like, the downstairs front area and where the police department was and there's like an upstairs space could be uh, another section and then you could come in the front door and go upstairs and have office spaces upstairs um, and i thought of um, you know hearing that parking is a big issue um, i came up with a design for like 46 car spaces um, 16 would be for the building for the people renting the offices people stopping in at the flower shop um, the other spaces would be um, you know like the two hour parking for shoppers people coming down two three hour i don't know what usually is one of those things that you put in and uh, that'd be business hours and after hours i guess it could be you know as long as you wanted to go to the bars party in or whatever you know downtown um, kind of making the entrance a little bit bigger, moving the fire hydrant. So it'd be like two lanes, so there wouldn't be traffic congestion with any of the cars coming in and out. Uh, solar powered um, carport for the charging of the uh, electric cars. A couple of things like that we saw in the back parking lot. And that's kind of what we were. Yeah. So you were looking into, uh, you know, I know you've looked at the RFP we did for and that the trustees were looking for $200,000 from yeah. the lot. So you're looking into the possibility of funding and stuff of that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I saw in the paper there been some money for like, I don't know if that was says, like brought in for the parking lot itself. Um, I've read in the paper that 37,000 that other people we're thinking of coming up with to help with parking. I'm well, sure. the town has like, offered something, but they wanted a 99-year lease to go with it, which is that amount to actually owning it. So, you know, if you wanted to get 30 parking spaces for 37.5 for 99 years, that would be a pretty good deal. So I don't think anybody's looking seriously at 
you know, that uh, being a practical thing to do there. So, um, subdivision idea work here, though. Pardon? That's what this, we're could the subdivision at. idea work here? Where are you subdivision? Possibly. After parking the village, and then that, of course, reduces the what you would get for the half. Right. So but you'd make it up with yeah. the other half. Yeah. Yeah. Split yeah. it up and win. get the full amount. You know, this is Lefty's idea that, you know, we're looking to formulize and know just what you could do for a subdivision and how many spaces you would get. and then depending on the size of the lot, what's that worth versus, you know, the uh, part with the uh, existing building. And we've also set aside $50,000 to uh, take down and make it into a, you know, parking lot during Main Street construction. And we've all don't know what it would really cost. So sending out an RFP folks, um, you know, to get real costs to do it maximizing the amount of materials that could be recycled or reused and things. Um, there's still the issue of, uh, there's some asbestos in there in um, some linoleum and things. I don't know if you're gonna tear it down and send it to the landfill. Does that have to be removed or only if you're restoring the house, um, you need to get it out of there, I don't have the answers well, to Matt, that. Can I speak to that a little bit because we're going through it up at the Plato property, because there's a recent law passed on that, so you have, you have somebody come in, they see how much is there, and then they oversee it going, and you pay somebody to monitor yeah. taking it out. We finally got our plan yeah. approved. That's why that building's been sitting there, because we didn't have enough. Yeah. We had a quote of $6,000 to remove it out of 51. Dan Johnson did the investigation, and you know we need to get in writing for him to use the report, which we haven't done yet, so so this will be, um, you know, getting information about the real cost of removal and um, demolition and or you know subdividing and things. I think if we approved a RFP at our next meeting, it'd take a couple three weeks to get back, and it'd be something we would have the cost looking at in June, and um, at the same time, if you could. Um, you know, look at how many spaces Chris Parsons' proposal would require and yeah. how that could be fixed on the lot and things. Those would be two pieces of information that we would use to look at deciding, you know, where we would go with this in negotiations, either with Chris or what options the trustees would recommend. So. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I come up with, uh, I, mean, I already designed like a whole parking lot with all those spaces, measured all that stuff out there. Just, you know, I went out with the tape and taped some stuff off and designed a few different parking lots. Uh, three so far I've come up with, I did different size spacings. Um, yeah. so I don't Do you have a two-way drive? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah two-way drive. I was going to move the see where the hydrant could be moved to and I was uh, planning on leaving at least 10 feet off the brick building because the fascia is the uh, boundary line but I figure you know material falling off and snow removal uh, at least leave 10 feet for grass space and then along the uh, the building municipal building um, would just be like a painted a walk area instead of a raised sidewalk so it would be a little more clear and I think that was giving me uh, 10 or 11 feet on the lanes so that's be, about 10 foot is a yeah, travel way width yeah, and so and I didn't know what your guys' parking sizes were but I know I measured some of them and the ones you have there some of them are smaller and some were the same size as the ones that I planned on the ones that are behind the building more are bigger than the ones that are up against the other one and just those white spaces and uh, yeah, I figured uh, I think uh, five motorcycle parking spaces in a spot that wouldn't be really used, you know, long enough for car spaces, but you can get the bikes at, at an angle so you can fit more motorcycles in there. And uh, <laughs> um, the one side, the south side would be good for like one of those, you know, like the charging, a charging thing, because that'll happen in yep. the future. Those are popping up everywhere. So are you also getting some estimates for 
Well, a restoration type? Or? Uh, that's, yeah, well, it was tough knowing, like, I didn't know where all this stood. Like, am I, is it too late to come in and be like, hey, this is what I think, because I do need to get in there probably for two days to measure and see what's rotten or whatever, be able to figure out what the house is, because I didn't get up in to see what was leaking in the roof. Um, and I figured it would take at least two days to go over the whole thing to figure out what um, me and Chris Gendro could rebuild it for. Um, I don't have a real problem with you looking at it and things. You know, you've heard our kind of schedule where we're kind of progressing, and if in the meantime you wanted to look further with the idea that, you know, at some point you may want to you know, make an offer, but knowing, you know, just kind of where we are. That going yeah, that's forward. why, I, you know, I knew about the parking. You know, that's no problem. I mean, Nina's runs a flower shop. That's good for business all the way around to have more parking and, you know, that'd be traffic by her store. So that's, you know, that's, that's totally. And we have said that we're going to uh, take it to a vote of the village people would you know, whatever proposal we come up with that we think we yeah. recommend going forward, you know, there would be a public meeting and... Yeah, and the, with the, the, like the lease there, that was the other thing was like, what would you guys, would you be plowing and taking care of like the whole area? Um, well, we're not gonna take care of anything. So that's what I mean, the town, like if the town has it and there's a lease on it or, yeah, you know, like what was you know with the, the grass spaces in the around the yeah. old like those were just something. so if we subdivide it they would be totally responsible if we don't then it would be up to the town to kind of negotiate you know whatever use you were to allow them and what they were willing to do for it so that would be something totally outside our control to do yeah I just didn't know the the least and thing I don't was. no I don't think they've even talked about it. They just, you know, came up with that 37.5, but that town meeting, it was passed with a condition. You got to own them for 30, 99 years yes. and things. So, um, you know, I know Chris Parsons didn't think that was a real, he didn't want to tie up those lots for 99 years necessarily if, you know, whatever there were left so over. Some plow and mow. <laughs> um, you folks have anything to add to that or no I just think that um, if you pursue and dig in and want to um, make a proposal that that is something that that is the next step I guess is okay, so it's not too a proposal. late to do anything okay, um, we like it's Skip like said we are moving forward we've been working with Chris Parsons there's interest it just kind of keeps shaping a little differently you know the way we're considering you know the TD Bank we don't know what's happening with parking there it's just caused a lot more attention and and maybe you know that consideration is what we have in our sites for 51 South Main and so that we're trying to create you know maybe some more standard parking but nothing is set okay. so we can appreciate so bona fide interest know. that would have to come in the form of a, a proposal so yeah. that it that yeah. it has all of the piece parts that you can clearly state and in, in your intents because we need to review them and then share that with the village voters that will be the final um, viewer and decider, if you will. So I just get hold of Chris in like a couple of days. I get hold of you. Then. Yeah, have Woody here. Somebody kind of let you in there. And yeah. As far as the previous uh, arrangements for plowing and mowing, that there was no written agreement on it. The town just basically did it, but there was no. No compensation or anything from the village to the town. Right. To as long as the village owns it, I think, you know, yeah. the, I, it's easy. I direct the town and we yeah. take care of the, you know, the cost centers within the budget. Right. But, uh, you know, if it gets into private ownership, if it, as Skip said, if the property is subdivided, whoever owns one will be responsible for that property and whoever owns the other will be responsible for that. If it's if the town decided to 
exercise its lease option, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's unlikely, but. Yeah. I'd like to just say two things. I didn't know anything about this whole thing, but um, I know for the years that we've been discussing 51 South Main Street, there's people who would like to do the modern housing and all that, but there's also a large group of people who have wanted to keep that historical house and have it rejuvenated. And I know there are plenty of reasons why not, but there was a mentality out there that a lot of us had really awfully damaged houses that we moved back into. So I think that might satisfy a group of village people. Secondly, I just want you to know that Chris Gendro is amazing. He's restored the farmhouse, built the round barn. It is integrity about historical preservation is um, just amazing. So I was glad to, I mean, I think that you're dealing with some people who would, they might not be professional developers, but they definitely are people who have integrity and the ability to make it work. So I just want to say that. You didn't hear anything about it because they only started two weeks ago. Well, Chris is working on our house right now. Hope you didn't see no, but I mean the interest in trying to do something. And yeah. I think in terms of the trustees that, you know, the tipping over of the oil tank in that building put in it in a much yeah. worse condition than the houses we went back into. That's what happened to the um, thing with physical therapy, too. I mean, I, I'm... Yeah, that, that happened, they had to have it all cleaned up, they did, it's back. So I, I know, Skip, but I'm just saying that. And I also, this, this guy, he must have started his new business, but why were, we worked with him on the historical preservation bank for the grant. Oh, Scott, you're talking about? Yeah, Scott, he right. knows, so there's mm -hmm. money, and I forget the formula, I think if you, has to do with the cost of the land versus the cost of the building, if you take out the cost of the land, if you put more than 50% in, you get, some money back from the historical preservation. So that's well, I think you're talking about historic tax credits. No, yeah. it was it was for helping to rehab the buildings. And I used to work because I I dealt with it twice. When we were going to buy the big old house, he came down and told us that same thing. So right, the village wasn't eligible for that. What the village wasn't, but a person could be a private person could be running. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I know the tax credit program is available with both state and federal because right. it's a listed historic. All I know is he came down to Bigelow House and he took out the cost of the, of the land, which left Bigelow property at that point. He had a contract for 105. It was for 55. And once we spent over 55, the state of Vermont paid either between 30 and 50 percent of the rest to rehab. That so, might have been part of the flood. Uh, but, but it was before the flood. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not sure about that. And so, use some of that money. The, the, the flood the elevation state. there. Do you know what uh, you'd have to check with Steve. Well, I'll work with you on that. Okay. Yeah, yeah I can, you come in tomorrow or, yeah, we can talk about that. Okay, we're calling. Yeah. So, given all that, you're welcome to continue working on your thing, and we're going to proceed with getting these RFPs. And if you want to keep in touch, you know, please do that. Yes, and we'll do. Um, Thank you. You know, nobody knows. Anything is possible till the deed changes hands. So, uh, <laughs> All right, thank you. So, there's a, wait, we have a question, maybe. It was more general. I just didn't know if that was an offer for other folks as well in terms of people who want to present proposals. I applaud the trustees moving forward with getting RFPs and just continuing to move the process forward. Well, we're getting RFPs to take it down. I'm aware, yes. Yeah. And, and to subdivide. Right, so I well, we're I'm looking at the asking your letting Zeb sure. do a proposal. So if somebody else wants to investigate like Zeb is doing, are you willing to listen to that? Sure. Well, we're not going to go advertise it, but if they want to do it, they're welcome to. We did do the it. advertising before, and we had the right, okay, response. Right, there was very minimal mm -hmm. response to our initiative. But for right you now, know, from the last two meetings, my sense had been that the trustees were considering taking down the building or going with Chris Parsons' proposal. So I haven't well, we're, done anything for. We're negotiating. You're what, Chris? What do you think? Pardon? Negotiate. You're negotiating. Yeah. Oh. Yes, sir. At the present time. Uh, is there anything definite in terms of what happens to TD Bank that can be shared or not? And I'm not suggesting that uh, you should share it if you have it in a company. We have no knowledge of TD Bank. Am I on here? Yes. Did this young lady Thank you. do with a lot of women that have been dealing with potential purchases? Yes, and I'm taking touch with the environmental um, decisions. 
assessment right now. So the county has not yet transferred. Um, so I guess I would like the minutes to show that we would like um, to have uh, the public works director and Bill and his staff to come up with an RFP for the trustees to look at at our next meeting with regard to you know, demolition of the building and getting a cost. And I've written down some things I think we wanted to include in there, like maximizing the amount of materials that are either recycled or reused and, you know, restoring the site to, you know, filling in the cellar hole and grading it for parking. And uh, I can give you, you don't have to write these down, but um, I can give you this. And I also would like to, store the or save the stones from the cellar hole that they would be removed and uh, stored down at the ice center and use it to build a real stone wall at the parking lot at the Elm Street that we had the old stone foundation from the building we took down there but um, they disappeared from down at the ice center by the time we got to build the parking lot so this would put a real stone wall back in and things and um, you know, and identifying that there's a, I don't know what the size of the vault is there that's fireproof that needs to be taken out of the building too. It's, Maybe you can sell it. Take, <laughs> take out that. Good luck with that. <laughs> and then also we would have, if best of um, possible, to you know look at the parkings yeah. required for, so that the minutes would show that we would if possible, to have that at the next meeting. Yep, I'll prepare something. Is that agreeable to some information for the great. folks going forward? So. And the minutes will show the trustees will look into the Simpson Grace Seminary building with Down Street. You said you would, so I assume you will. It will be yes, there. we'll look into the legal aspects of whatever right. document. There's only four years, my calculation is only four years left on that. Oh. Um, next up was minutes. Bill had a couple things. I right. was going to do them after oh. the minutes. Yeah, you have minutes of the April 11th meeting. That the only one we have? You read those and. Let me just look at that. That was the meeting we had without Bill. Oh, yeah. Oh. And the bit and the cruiser. What's that? Yeah, moving to South Carolina. Uh, nothing to do. No, there's nothing in South Carolina. <laughs> Isn't that Georgia. where you just went? No. no. Oh. I drove through it, but I didn't go there. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of the trustee minutes for April 11th. As second. Presented. I'll second it. Motion's been made and seconded to approve the uh, village trustees minutes of the meeting of April 11th. All those in favor say aye. Uh -huh. aye. Aye. Motion passes. Um, next up, you had a couple things to. Yeah, this is just a minor issue. Um, <coughs> Jeff Kilgore is um, moving on from his law firm. Um, he is going to continue as the county probate judge and he's um, got a relationship with Stackpole and French from Stowe and evidently he will be of counsel to that firm. So um, he's to, this letter just asks if uh, will we pick up all of our records and take them, you know, get a different attorney or is it okay to just have them go to Stackpole and French? I think, as you know, um, we, as the town and village, don't really have a dedicated municipal attorney. We use Paul Giuliani for a lot of municipal corporation stuff, bond council. We use, um, we use Stitzel and Page for a lot of our land use planning stuff. We've used uh, Jeff's office. We've used uh, Chris Norville and Darby and those. So. My recommendation would be simply let the 
files go to Stackpole and French, he's still going to have a relationship with them if we ever should need anything. You know, Jeff is still going to be available through that office. So um, that's what my recommendation would be, but I just wanted to make sure the trustees knew. And if you thought you wanted to do something different, you'd have to let me know. So he'd still be able to represent us in similar matters, or he's I, getting I, out know, of it all he, together? He's, he's transitioning out of his private practice. Um, I'm not sure what it exactly means when he will be serving of counsel to that firm, but I think if there was something that um, we really needed to have somebody dig into, as long as he's there, he might do that. But I think for the purposes of keeping files, it's just as easy to let it go there. And, uh, you know, if we have occasion to use Jeff and he says, no, I, I don't do that anymore and we're not happy with the choices at that firm, we can move it at any time. Mm -hmm. But I think for now, I would just recommend let the files go there. We have copies of everything anyway. Well, pretty much. Mm. Probably. Um, <laughs> well, know, all the yeah, legal no. stuff in the vault. Yeah, so the, every, anything that's been recorded or filed or anything else, yeah. we obviously have all of that. But, um, Is that okay with Sounds good to me. It yeah, agreed. Makes sense to give them a good chance. <laughs> you can show that the trustees agreed with Bill's recommendation. Let the files go with, with Jeff there. Okay. Um, well, we can keep it because we're going to do the same thing for the select board. So we'll just do it at the same time. Do you want to review the budget? Or sure. All right. It won't take past 5 o'clock, will it? I don't think it'll take past 10 of 5. Ah, that's even better. <laughs> you have a revitalizing one very mixture of 5 to 7, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so anyway, this is the budget report. I did it through today as opposed to, um, well, we haven't hit the end of April yet anyway. Um, and there's nothing um, special to point out here. Uh, we did sell the cruisers, as the trustees know. We took that action while I was away. Um, we budgeted $16,000 for the sales of those assets and the actual uh, revenue generated from the sale of the cruisers um, was $21,301. There may have been a few other assets that were sold before that, but. 18,000 something for the SUV and 2,500 or whatever. So um, on the revenue side, um, under other governments up at the top, um, I have to look at the water and sewer. Is this really a $681 gas refund? Is all for the would have been for the police cruisers as opposed to some of it going to the water department and sewer department? I'd have to check the Okay. So I'll look at that, but right now it's showing we got more than we there. We didn't budget anything, but uh, I knew we'd get something. Um, there's really nothing else on the revenue side. We don't expect a lot of revenues. Um, we already have. Uh, except for the transfer of $75,000, we already have more than we expected, or almost as much as we expected to get. And then in terms of the expenditures, uh, very minimal. Um, the professional and consulting services, I think part of what we just saw earlier is there, uh, the historical uh, district is yeah. professional consulting services. Um, we haven't been billed for any legal services in the uh, general government yet for this year. Uh, the $50,000 that we talked about for the building mm -hmm. down is, is there. Um, the town, I had the town pay a full administrative service fee to the village 
or the village paid the full administrative service fee to the town um, already because I was suspecting the village would be out of business by June 30th. So that, that's been paid. Um, insurance, uh, one, one uh, about a half of that has been paid. We'll pay the other half of the general government insurance before the end of June. And that's it, really. Um, you know, the police department is no longer with us. When's our rent going out? At the end, uh, of end of May. I end of May. We got one more month to pay. Yeah. On that police department issue, I would, if you could, let the minute show that the trustees really thank Lefty for all his efforts to. Uh, oversee the, oh, the conditioning and uh, taking care of the cruisers in the meantime and keeping the battery charged and getting the what's that rebate on the oh, recall yeah. that he worked very hard to get the village eight hundred dollars return so so is that in here the eight hundred that the trustees really express our I had fun riding around <laughs> Did you blow the or I promised no, no. I wouldn't. I didn't. <laughs> I'll get a question. When the, you said there were no general legal issues, and maybe I missed this in the village report, which could be it because I don't remember anything. But what happened with the man, the police officer that was suing us? When the village goes defunct, does that end? Well, most of those most of those costs are being borne by the village's insurance company. So the, all the court costs and the defense costs, um, uh, the village has had some expenses uh, for associate lawyers and the lawyer that the trustees hired to um, kind of create the record and make sure due process was um, followed during that. But the lion's share of the um, litigation costs in court have been paid by the insurance company. Um, if at the end of the day there's any um, award made for back wages or anything, um, the village may have to pay that as opposed to the insurance company. But um, we're still waiting for the final resolution. The, uh, I was just curious because if there's no village, what is that? It's a district assumes all, all of the liabilities. All the liabilities of the village, so okay. you don't Thank get you. off that. Yeah, speaking about the Hubak case, right? Yeah. Not the potential suit that Joey might or might not come forth with as an attorney. We haven't heard any more on that, so. But you were speaking specifically about the Hubak situation as far as bills. Yes. Costs. <laughs> so that. And that's where the village, if there was a, you know, award we had to pay, that it could assess a tax to pay that because you couldn't use water and sewer money to pay it off. But we could use money from the tax stabilization fund if we wanted to or pay it off. Or, But you'd have a meeting to vote a, how you were going to pay for it and things. But, so. No problem. So is that it for that's it. Um, Good. Motion to adjourn. For I put on their next meeting, which would be uh, the uh, second Wednesday of May. So the night. That suits me. Yeah. Okay. I move we adjourn. Here we go. Second it. <laughs> and everybody say, let's go.